I feel some reward this morning. When Sister Linda and I in 1972 went to Saigon, there was no full gospel work in that land. And <clears throat> now many years later, I don't know, we don't have any direct connection with Julia and Stephen, except that they come from Hanoi. And our prayer was that there would be a great church that God would raise up in Vietnam. And we planted seeds, and there are churches around Vietnam today because of the seeds that we planted. <clears throat> And so we're richly rewarded. As soon as I met the Pops, I felt so excited because they came from Vietnam. And I praise God for the chance, the opportunity to see another generation of people, what they call God, on their life to plant churches. And that's what our mission is all about. United Bethel, plant churches, bring people to know Jesus, born again, amen. Thank you, Sister Julia, thank you, Stephen, for being here, and we're well, proud. I want to let you know, folks, that we as in the missions committee have taken on the funds to bless them, and we want you to be praying for them, that God would bless them and use them, make them fruitful in ministry. Just like we pray for United Bethel for us to be fruitful in ministry. Hallelujah. Now, <clears throat> I am not going to preach. And everybody said, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> He said it's not going to preach. I started a sermon last Sunday. The sermon was titled, The Servant's Heart. I talked about how Jesus emptied himself, left heaven, and came to this earth. Paul described the incarnation in five words. Second, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul says, Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He's just been talking about deacons and elders in the church. <clears throat> and when he finished, he talked about the mysteries of God. Well, that's the things that God is doing that we don't understand. He called them mysteries. But one thing he said, he said in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16, five little words, he appeared in a body. That's the incarnation of Jesus. God became a human being. He appeared in a body. We couldn't go up to God. Nobody could go up and enter heaven unless God made a way. So he came down to us. I want you to remember something. God came after you. He came looking for you. He came speaking. He came giving. God so loved the world, he gave his son. He came after you. Don't forget that. Praise God. He's taught us. You know, people say, how do you know there's a heaven? What a good way to answer that is, well, someone came from heaven, told us about that place. How do you know God loves us? Well, look how Jesus laid out his 
life. He became the greatest servant leader ever. Now, I'm using this theme because I want to talk to you about servants in United Bethel Church. Now, Jesus demonstrated to his disciples very clearly what he did when he washed their feet. The Bible describes in John 13, chapter, how Jesus, when they were all there in the room, these disciples were reclining at a table. Uh, I would find it it's a lot easier to sit in a chair for me, but uh, they could recline at a table and eat. And Jesus got up and he put on, I guess it was an apron. These ladies wear aprons in the kitchen so you don't get your clothes messed up. My father made an apron for me one time and it said uh, something about barbecue. And she made it so I could go out to the barbecue oven in the yard and, and cook some steaks or something. I like to grill uh, lamb's ribs on the cup. But I have an apron. And I think it says Grandpa on it. But anyway, uh, Jesus put on something. He took some water, a pan, and a towel, and he went around to the disciples and washed their feet. When he came to Peter, Peter said, ha -ha, You're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, Well, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you don't have anything to do with me. In other words, we have to let Jesus be the servant. You have to let him be the one to die for your sins. You can't pay for those sins, except with your life. Wait, sin is what? It's death. Jesus went to the cross to pay for our sins. That was the greatest act of servanthood. He came to serve us. <clears throat> then Jesus made a statement when he finished washing their feet. John 13, verse 15. Can you find that slide? It's number, I think it's slide number 9. I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Okay. Christians, Jesus is talking to us. I have given you an example. You should do as I have done. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who sent, who is sent greater than he who sent. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Well, <clears throat> There are some churches that have foot washing ceremonies. Now you know you can take anything and make a ceremony out of it until it no longer has an impact or a meaning. But if I, uh, does this have a battery? Okay, I'll try to hold it more carefully. Something's fading in and out. We should follow Jesus' example. Attitude, the heart of a servant. I'm going to treat mics. know what this one is, okay. What's going on this morning? I get tangled up everything I do. All right. Go ahead and laugh. It's good. I would receive your laughter. 
I deserve it. <laughs> Jesus said, you should do what I have done. Now, I told you last week one of the destiny moments for this church came when we were meeting in the old building and we were just about to start Servant Leader Institute. We, we were in the stages of writing the material for that training program. And I felt impressed of the Lord to wash somebody's feet. I've never done it before. Uh, I haven't done it since. That I didn't know of. But there was a young man in that meeting one Friday night, and uh, I felt impressed to wash his feet. So I went to him and I said, take your shoes, shoes and socks off. And I wish you could have seen the expression on his face. Some of you know this guy, and I'm not going to mention his name because I, I want to be able to say this clearly without my conscience bothering me. He didn't like it. He objected. He didn't want to take his shoes off. He didn't want me to wash his feet. But I persuaded him. Some of you know I tried to persuade you to do something that you didn't want to do. I, I persuaded a number of people to let their names go up as nominee for deacon. And I knew the tensions that would be developing there and, and the, the nervousness and stuff. But I asked him because I wanted to let the Lord speak through the process of determining our deacons. Well, this young man let me wash his feet and we began to picture what servanthood would look like in the church. We, we serve one another. After I washed his feet, he said to me, take your shoes and socks off, and I'm going to wash your feet. And so I was just about as embarrassed to let him wash my feet as he was to let me wash his feet. That was painful. We had not done that before. I don't know if we'll ever do it again. You deacons, relax. I'm not going to introduce this into the board of deacons. You don't have to worry. Some of them have been worried, I heard this week, when I talked about it. So I just want to set your mind at ease. I promise you that I will not ask you to wash your feet without warning you first. That's like the guy that said, I'm going to eat this. I'm, this is the last piece of cake I'm going to eat with my left hand. It's a promise that's not very good. But uh, deacons, relax, okay? We will not be washing feet in a deacon's name. But the idea of us having the heart of a servant remains. All of us should have a servant's heart like Jesus. Now, deacons are people who serve. That's basically what the name deacon meant in the beginnings. They are not lords, masters, generals, commanding officers, policemen directing traffic. That's not deacon's ministry. Ministry of deacons is serve the church. In the book of Acts, chapter 6, the first deacons, were selected, and after they were selected, I'm not even sure they had an election. I don't think there was any such thing as a democracy in Jerusalem at that time. And in fact, uh, I have to tell you, uh, I've been a student of the Bible uh, for so many years, and I have not discovered democracy in the Bible. Now, we thank the Lord for a democracy because that's a form of government in which we have a voice, we have a participation, we can put up people into government by electing them, and uh, if we keep our position, we can elect someone else to replace them if we want to replace them. That's what democracy does. But in Scripture, the deacons were selected, and then they had a ceremony. 
I think it was kind of like an installation ceremony, which we're about to do here, where the two new, well, one of them's new and one of them is re-elected for a second term. But uh, we're going to have a ceremony here in just a few minutes. And I will ask the two newbies to come. And I'm going to have them kneel here. And then I'll ask the rest of the active deacons to come and stand behind them. And then I'm going to ask you as a congregation to stretch out your hand as if you were laying hands on those new deacons. Because we're going to pray, and it's like a like an installation of them into this office. They are elected for three years. And one of them, Brother Henry, uh, has just finished a three-year term. And in our Constitution, it's possible for a deacon to serve two consecutive terms. Then they have to go off the Board of Deacons, and we say give given a sabbatical or given a break, and they may or they may not be elected again for another term, but they have to be off the board for a year after they've served six years. Brother Henry has served three years, and he was elected for another term, and Brother uh, Ricky, can I call you Ricky? Is that all right? That's what everybody's been calling you anyway. This is his first time. But we're going to have a, 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 an inauguration service here, and we all participate in this. I want you to pray for our deacons. God has given the church a wonderful board of deacons. Those who serve are godly people. They are worthy of reward. They have done a wonderful job. My job as pastor has been made so easy because of an active board of deacons who have a servant's heart. Sometimes uh, we have a deacon speaking every second Sunday of the month after the, the second service. And sometimes they're only two hours. But there have been times when we've been there for four hours just uh, solving problems and taking care of things. And uh, I don't know how long today's meeting will be this afternoon, but uh, uh, our deacons will have the first meeting with the old and the new after this service. The apostles laid hands on those deacons. And you know what? Some of those deacons in the first board of seven, two of them became evangelists and travel preaching the gospel. I don't know if God will call any of our deacons to preach, but it's okay. You see what God says. Amen. I may be, I may be asking the deacons to preach here from this pulpit. And uh, I hope that you would pray for that and, and want to see that because there are people who love the Lord and want to serve Him. Amen. Now, <clears throat> this laying on of hands, that's how Steve, uh, Timothy, who was a young man who found Christ when Paul the Apostle was traveling, and at some point in the church where uh, Timothy was, the elders of the church laid hands on him and at that time, God imparted some gifts into Timothy. Now, I'm not saying what will happen when we lay hands on our deacons this morning, but I believe the Holy Spirit is here. And I expect miracles. I think you do too. We expect God to do something great in this church. And that means all of us who want to serve the Lord need to be mobilized. We get mobilized first by what the Holy Spirit is saying in us. We get mobilized because we train and we prepare ourselves just like Stephen and Julia are doing. We get mobilized to serve the Lord when we attend 
our discipleship or our Servant Leaders Institute. By the way, uh, we're going to have a funeral for SLI. It served its purpose for over 30 years, and we're not going to try to resuscitate it, revive it, restore it. We're going to replace it. And uh, that's coming. We're going to be rolling out some things next month. And uh, uh, one of the things that we do expect to roll out is a ministry called Heart and Bowl. Some of you will want to be a part of that. It'll involve fasting and praying and worshiping. And it will involve your time and sacrifice on your part, those of you who become a part of it. Not everybody will become a part of the Heart and Bowl ministry, but some of you will. And uh, we'll be talking about that more next month. 